Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before we get started this afternoon, I'd like to take a moment to present the AP's Coach of the Year for 2015 to John Calipari. Thank you. Thank you very much. No applause, thank you. <laughs> this year's Coach of the Year has brought a lot more than a team of talent to this year's Final Four. He's brought a team that may make the history books. Kentucky has a chance to end this weekend and do something that no team has done since the 1970s, which has finished the season undefeated and with a national championship. To get there, Coach Calipari has instilled a team-first attitude in a group of exceptional individuals with NBA futures ahead of them. Something notable about this year's honor is that Kentucky finished this year ranked number one in the AP's poll and was a unanimous choice for 12 of those weeks. This is the first time that Calipari has received the AP's award, but he joins two other Kentucky coaches, Eddie Sutton and Tubby Smith, who received the honors previously. On behalf of the AP and our panel of media voters, it is my pleasure to present this year's Coach of the Year Award to John Calipari. Thank you. Do you stand up? We do. And we're going to open a, a first question from Jim McConnell of the Associated Press. Jim. Uh, John, I'm sitting next to the famous guy. <laughs> uh, do, about the Coach of the Year Award as well and how it works into it. You've been to so many Final Fours now, but th with the undefeated record looming over you. How different has this Final Four been in how you've had to treat the team as they're coming in here? Every team. Jim, that you, you coach is different. And um, uh, my first team when I was at UMass, we really had backed up and were trying to keep them loose. It was our first time, school's first time. Probably didn't do as good a job as I needed to because of that. I mean, our practices were an hour. Um, when we went back and at Memphis, uh, that team had a spirit about them that they wanted to go but we did back off some, but not as much as we did. This year's team, I mean, we had two vicious practices Tuesday and Wednesday, and I mean, I was on them like it was December. Um, this is a team that wants to go at each other, and our advantage is that we have a lot of guys. So when we scrimmage, that you really benefit by that, and they want to. They don't want to do drills. This is not a drill team. Stop the drills. Throw the ball up. And then they go after each other. They argue every call. They fight every, the whole, and I have to blow, stop it. That's, I'm saying that five times a practice. So we went at it. Um, we're basically done now. Um, I feel that, you know, we've done what we're supposed to do with this team, but you never know. I'll probably, after it's over, say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have gone so hard. You know, I mean. Back over here. Mike DeCourcy from Sporting News. John, um, obviously you've had to learn to trust freshmen a lot uh, over the last several years, uh, but it seems to me that you have a level of trust in Tyler Ulis that is uncommon uh, even for your circumstance. Can you explain what it is about him that inspires so much trust? Well, I've had other freshmen that I've really trusted, like really, really said, I'm with you. I've had guys tell me, calm down, I got this, and then I calm down and I sit down and let them do their thing. Um, with Tyler, you know he's going to bring it. He's going to go as hard as he can. He doesn't always play great, but he brings it. The second thing you know, he's playing for his team. I've got to get him to score more like I did Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose, his inclination was create for his team, make him make everybody happy. Um, Tyler from Chicago is like the same. I mean, you know, like the shot in the corner against Notre Dame. He posted it. It came back. He reposted it. 
Kenny and I at the same time, you let that thing go, you let it go, and it came back to him, and he made that three, which basically kept us in the game. Um, but he's he's uh, been injured now. He's uh, he's been injured for months now with shin splints. So he's been, but he he knows if he doesn't practice, I'm not playing him. So he figures it out. Right here in the front. Matt Norlander, CBSSports.com. Uh, John, the four best big men in college basketball are here, all projected lottery picks. Is that coincidence or a culmination? I look. I. I know how important big guys are, and I'm proud of R2. I mean, I, you think of how far Carl has come in a year. It's ridiculous. But how far Willie has come in his career is truly ridiculous, too. But at this time of the year and in college basketball, guard play is vital. And for us right now, Andrew and Aaron, Devin and Tyler, but Andrew and Aaron are doing what they did a year ago, which is dragging our team. Um, the good news for those two, if they're not all on point, you got Tyler and you got Devin. But our big guys and the big guys of the other team, they give you a presence around the goal. We scored against Notre Dame for nine straight minutes because we threw it to the post every single time. That would have never happened if we didn't have a post player like Carl. All right, straight back here. Don, Dan, Dan Uthman from USA Today Sports. How important is it for you to connect your current players at Kentucky with your past players at Kentucky? I don't have to do that. Those kids do it themselves. I mean, uh, our former players are in touch with our players, are in touch with our staff. Um, you know, I get the texts and the calls and the, um, you know, they, they know um, over all-star break if they're not playing, they stop in. Uh, in the summers, they always will pass through. Um, it's been it's been a great thing to see how they help each other and talk to one another. Um, Anthony Davis sat down with Carl, basically told him, "Hey kid, you 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 better step on the gas here." And you know, came in and talked to him about it. it it's just it's been fun being a part of this family, knowing that. Um, they benefited by the experience of being at Kentucky, and they give back. They give back in a lot of ways, but they give back to each other. Right over here. Daniel Powers, Daniel Powers, the pennant. Uh, what is the biggest challenge when coming back to the Final Four other than comp uh, the opponent you'll be competing against? Tickets. You want me to say something else? I, I mean, that's the most, the challenge is staying away from that, getting your players to stay away from it. Uh, this year, and again, this is the sixth Final Four I've been in, this ticket is ridiculous, more than any other. Well, take that back. We were in the Meadowlands with Kentucky and Syracuse and Mississippi State. That was a ridiculous ticket, too, back in the day. Right here, in front. Noah Kozlov, Cinesport. Bo Ryan said that he remembers you going back to the five-star camps when he was there and you were doing your thing there. What do you remember about Bo then and also early memories of the other two coaches here? Well, um, my respect for all three of these guys, I, I, I've talked about Bo. See, Bo was one of those guys as an assistant you always looked at because he was a class act. He did his job. He was into coaching. He's a basketball Benny. He speaks his mind. You know, hold back. He speaks his mind. Um, he goes to Division Three, which most guys would not do, and he goes undefeated a couple seasons, win national championships. So then he goes to Wisconsin, and everybody says, you can't have a division. He's not. He's a coach. He's a basketball Benny. He's into the game, and he's done the same. And every time I see him, we just go spend time. He's from Chester. I'm from Coriopolis, Moon Township. I mean, you're talking the same kind of upbringing and, and all those things. And so we become close. Tommy and I, were, we're, we've gone through this at the same uh, stages. And, you know, I mean, he, he's a guy that I always, throughout the year, well, I'll call him if I have issues, something happening. If I see something good happening for him, he knows he's on, I'm on the phone for him. Um, and we're, we compete, but we don't compete. In other words, I don't see him 
I got to be Tom and be better. I want him to do everything, win national titles. He knew I was happy they went to the Final Four this year. He knew. And I called him. He said, I know you're happy. And everybody, oh, because he beat Louisville. No, I'm happy for Tom. Well, that too, maybe. I don't know. But I was happy for Tom that he got that team and brought them together when they struggled. And then I've said about Coach K, I respect what he's done in coaching. I respect what he's done over decades. I respect the numbers, which are jaw-dropping. But what moves me is what he's done for mine. USA Basketball with, first of all, Derrick Rose, went from figuring it out, getting better, to MVP. You had Anthony Davis. He went from, am I, what am I, who am I, to I'm as good as anybody, to all-star, to gold medal winner. I begged he and Jerry Colangelo, please, the difference you will make for DeMarcus is going to be, you, you will take his career, you will save another. And they kept him on that team, and look what happened for DeMarcus. He's an all-star. He's a 2020 machine. I mean, he's ridiculous. But what he's done for mine, that moves me. And I've told him publicly and I've told him privately how much I appreciate what he's done for my kids. Right back here. Paula Bovin, uh, Arizona Republic. Uh, John, you are the pup, I guess, of the, these coaches, the youngest of the four. Are, is that, you... we're old then. This is an old crew, <laughs> if I'm the youngest of the four. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> no, I, I just wondered if you guys have all been so accomplished, successful. How have you prevented burnout, and is there room for hobbies in your business when you're taking so much time in basketball? What, what are you saying, hobbies? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, um, I don't live and die with this stuff. The people that know me know I have other interests. Um, I'm focused on helping these kids reach their dreams. Their dreams are my dreams. I sit on the same side of the table as them and their families. Um, want to win, want to win for the university I work for, want to win for the program. But the reality of it is our season ends June 28th here. That's when our season's over. And that makes this different for me anyway. It makes it different. And, uh, you know, whether I'm with my family, um, I like to travel, I like to go to baseball games, I like to go to football camps, I like to go to different events and hang out, and I love being with my friends, big dinners. Um, that's who I am, what I do. My wife's not always happy, where are you? But. Right over here. Mike McCaffrey, ESPN. Uh, obviously, the coach you knew the pressure that this team would face. How much have you emphasized just avoiding distractions and drama that you know can hurt teams as they face pressure like that? We're we're concerned about us, to be honest with you. And I they I talked to him last night again. We have one job, and individually, it's be the best version of yourself. Get yourself mentally and physically prepared to be your best. We have to play at our best. That's the best we can do. I can't ask him for anything else. I told him, I don't know the outcome. I can't promise you the outcome. But I do know our chances are best if you're the best version of you and we're at our best as a team. I said, things are going to go crazy. We'll adjust. We've done it all year. I said, if I can count on you for effort, you can count on us for adjustments. So, right here. Hi, Coach. JoJo Gentry with Butler University. How would you describe the evolution of Trey Lyles from the time that you got him to current day? Well, he was injured this summer. He didn't get to play with us uh, in the Bahamas. So the way this played out, which really for him personally was ideal, when Willie came back, Trey was going to have to play three because I had to play other people. Trey is probably a 4-3. Trey professionally will be a 4, stretch 4. He's playing 3 for us. He's playing like a small forward guard. It's helped him become a better defender. Um, you get to see his post game against players that, you know, he's 6'10". But then he got sick, and he was out three weeks. 
Um, good news is he did not lose weight, which we were fearful of. So when he came back, he came back about 80%, and he's worked his way back. He is the X factor for our team. He did not play well against Notre Dame, and he knows it. Matter of fact, no, I won't say that. He didn't play well against Notre Dame. Now he's our X factor. He's that one guy that's hard to guard, that can make plays, can rebound, can play big, and makes us a really, really big team. Seven foot, seven foot, six ten, six six, six six. Makes us really big. Right here. John, Corey Elliott, National Sports Journalism Center. The Elite Eight game at the end when the final horn sounded, your, your guys ran into the floor and embraced each other like they made it to the final four and they weren't supposed to be here. And it's, is that a mentality that, that they've created on their own or embraced to avoid the going undefeated and all the pressures that come with it? Is that something you've brought on to, to, the, to the team? They're, they're kids. They're 18 and 19 year old kids. And, and for Carl Towns and those other freshmen, they had never been to a Final Four. The other guys had been there, but, you know, it was a hard game. We were lucky to win. And so you saw their joy. You know, people said, I can't remember if we didn't cut down nets somewhere or our conference tournament. We forgot. It was no like, oh, they're not enjoying the moment. No, I, we forgot. Um, but they, I wanted them to enjoy the moment. It's a great accompl accomplishment. I mean, getting to the Final Four is really really hard and to be able to do it I don't care what your record is because everybody is zero and zero right right now whether you're Duke Michigan State Wisconsin or us everybody's record is the same we're all feeling the same thing we all want to win a national title so you have two losses six losses zero losses 11 losses eight doesn't matter and that's why for us right now let's just be at our best if that's not good enough I'll deal with the results Right back here. Uh, John Brady McCullough from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm sure you don't spend a lot of time thinking about awards, but um, you've had a lot of great teams over the years, and this is the first time I believe you've gotten a National Coach of the Year award from writer voters um, here at the USBWA. I'm curious if you're surprised that you got this, and do you think it maybe indicates that uh, there's a change in perception about you as a coach? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to tell me. I know this. I'm the same guy I've always been. Well, not really. A lot of things change as you get older, but my heart's the same. My friends are the same. My approach to things are the same. Hopefully, I've matured and grown up a little bit. Um, that's questionable also, I hear. Um, but, um, yeah, I, you know, look. I always say this, the reason I'm not worried about now and how I'm evaluated or legacy stuff, it doesn't matter. 50 years from now when we're all gone, people will look back without emotion and say, what has he done? What did he do for people? What did he do for the universities? Not just me, all coaches. And, and your legacy is how did he benefit these people, these families, and did they benefit by that connection? doesn't matter what I say now. It's, you know, 50 years from now, people will look back and either like what we did or not. Right over here. Taylor Zarzer, Sirius XM. Coach, uh, Coach K recently on his radio show at Charles Barkley on, and both of them seem to suggest that college kids and young pros all want to be rich and famous. Not all of them want to do what it takes to win, aren't as competitive maybe as players used to be. Would you agree with that? And would you say your team is unique in that it seems all of them are so competitive? Well, here, here's, I want, you, ha you have to understand, one, where the kids come from. I'm not saying they're all poor, but many of them are, they struggled, their family, their family needs to breathe. They finally get a chance to breathe in life, to put their toes up. When kids go to the NBA, their first thing is, they're not thinking about winning, and it's not about money. It's about establishing who they are. Then they worry about winning. That was every pro, and that was always. Maybe Magic, because he stepped into a team that had three other Hall of Famers, 
And maybe Magic is just a different soul, a different soul, and I believe he is. He's a great guy. But most guys went into the league. Michael scored, scored 40, and he figured out, this isn't going to win me a championship, and he went back. And he said, I'll score less, I'll defend more, and we'll win championships. And all of a sudden, he's the best player in the history of our game, or arguably. But I think the kids nowadays are the same. Look, Anthony's trying to establish himself. So is John. So is the, They want to win, but they need to be established. After they're established as players, the whole focus becomes winning. It's not about money then. It's not about how many points. So I, I think in a way, you may say yes. Now, the money's different. I mean, the money is different. And uh, as a coach, I try to respect that. These, these kids... These kids have a genius just like anyone else on our college campuses who can leave and go start a business and become Twitter, become Bill Gates, become Steve Jobs. They're no different. And it's not size and athleticism. If they didn't have a mind, there's no way they're going to make $250 million. You have to have the mind for it too. These kids have a genius. And we try to respect that. I mean, I'm not going to hold a kid back. I'm not going to tell him you're, you're bad for wanting to chase your dream. And I tell them all, you can always come back and finish. You have a spot on this university, and we'll pay for it. Go chase your dreams. We're here for you. All right, back here, Nancy. Nancy Armour, USA Today Sports. Kind of following up on that, Cal. You take a lot of criticism for the one and dones, but you're not the only one who's doing it. So why, why do you think you're the lightning rod for it? I got a big nose. I don't know. I mean, it, but it's not my rule. It's the NBA and the Players Association. Now, what we need to do is control what we can control as far as the NCAA and college basketball, which means don't put up roadblocks that encourage kids to leave if they're not ready. Don't have them pay for their own disability insurance and know I got a $50,000 debt. If I stay another year, it's 100000 don't do that to him. If a kid chooses to stay because he really loves college, but he's worried about his draft position moving drastically, then maybe the NBA should pay for their loss of value insurance so they can be encouraged to, if you really want to stay, stay. Understand, if we can get kids to stay two years and two summers, they're a little than a year away from a college degree, maybe a year and a half. Why wouldn't we want that? Why wouldn't we do stipends? How about this thought? How about parents being able to get a loan versus future earnings? What's the problem? Their son's going to be worth $25 million. Let them get a loan for future, based on future earnings, maybe through the NBA. Let the NBA do it. Now you're not pushing kids out the door. I don't ask kids to stay, and I don't tell them to leave. I'll give them my opinion, and if they say, I want to stay and I believe they should leave, they better tell me why. Patrick Patterson said, one, I'm going to graduate in three years, two, I've never played in an NCAA tournament, and three, you're going to move me away from the basket and teach me how to play basketball. I said, welcome back. Those were good reasons. Don't tell me, well, coach, you can improve my free throw shooting. Stop. They can do that up there. You're the seventh pick of the draft. you got to do it. Nothing would hurt me more than a young man coming back and moving in the wrong direction in the draft or getting hurt and something happening. I, I couldn't live with myself. We're going to stop momentarily and bring the Kentucky players up to join us. And while we wait, let's, go, let's just go ahead. Let's uh, back, back here in the corner. Gasper, Boston Globe, Cal, sort of piggybacking off that last question. Given the success that you've had, the graduation numbers you mentioned yesterday, why do you think that for many you're still a polarizing figure in college basketball? Why don't they just embrace the success? I don't know if I am as much as you want to portray it. Maybe I am. It's not that I'm trying to be, but here's, here's my focus. I'm not focused on changing people's mind who don't know me, their opinion of me. I'm doing my job for these kids. If you like that, I'm happy. If you don't like that or don't like that, kids, that's your problem, not mine. I'm not doing this to please everybody. I'm doing this to please these young people and their families. Um, that's my mission. 
Now, as that plays out in the next 50 years, maybe I was wrong doing it this way, being about players first. Maybe I'm not wrong about doing this, and we start moving in a direction to do more for these kids and help them and make sure we're based on them. Not program. The program will be here 50 years from now. Kentucky's program will be right here where I'm sitting 50 years from now. But what we do for these kids change their whole lives in the direction, and that's how I look at this. Come on up. Come on up, guys. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Willie Colley Stein, Aaron Harrison, Andrew Harrison, Trey Lyles, and Carl Anthony Towns. I think we're missing one of the guys still. Where's Willie? Thanks, fellas. What's he doing? I think he's on his way, Kyle. Uh, we'll go right over here. Michael Pointer from the Indianapolis Star. John, when um, Bo Ryan was up here about an hour ago, he said last year in Texas, the shooting background just kind of blew him away because it was so wide open, it was hard to adjust to. He thought this year would be a little better, even with the dome. Just what your you were down there. Just what your take on that, and do you expect it to be better this year here? I thought it was great. We won the game, so I thought it was outstanding. Plus the shot. Did it bother you, Aaron, on that game winner? No, it was good. It was good. He said, um, "Tough playing in domes. The worst one we've played in as a coach. We played in the 2011 Final Four in Houston. That was hard. Every team shot 30 percent. It was crazy." I don't think that'll be the case here. I think they got, we've got all four teams are good shooting teams. Um, the backdrop and the way that, you know, it's hard. We went out like to say 75,000. It looks like it's 30. Doesn't, and we play in a building that seats 25. I don't think it'll be an issue. Right here in the back. Dennis Crosby from Time Water Cable Sports Channel, Wisconsin. This is for each of the players. If you could briefly touch about what you respect most about Wisconsin from your preparation. Carl, we'll start with you. Yeah, don't do every play. Uh, just a great team, and I mean, they have a great yeah. coach also. It's a great program, so yes. I think all together, you just have to respect the whole program as a general to make a, a team like that come together. Andrew? Um, I mean, everything about them. And, um, they execute well, play tough defense. They have a great player inside, so it'll be tough to beat them tomorrow. Okay, right down here in front. Zach Papilla, New York Post. John, I know you're focused on Wisconsin, but do you see any similarities between UConn last year and Michigan State this year? Both seven seeds, both teams that were kind of under the radar. And, and also, to follow up on that, why do you think it is that a team like that comes, can come out of nowhere like they have and get to this point? They defend. Connecticut, by the end of the year, was a really good defensive team. And two, they get good guard play. So in this tournament, if you have those two things, you have a chance. I told Tom, after I watched Wisconsin tape with them, about, I saw Michigan State, I, I texted him and said, you know you can win this thing. He said, no, we know we can. So they're, this is four teams, all has it, we all have a chance. It's gonna be a tough, tough deal for any of the teams. Right back here. Uh, John Greg Logan, New York Newsday. You cringed last week when one of your players used the word desperation after the Notre Dame game. Uh, when you look back on that, because things were finally, you know, it's finally coming into focus what's at stake, how much did that game uh, help prepare you for this moment? Well, the, the game was great. Desperation is, is just not a term I've used, and normally they use terms that I use. So that's when I heard desperation. I said, geez, I had never heard that word. Um, but, and, and I think it was from Willie. Um, was the one that said it. But the point of they didn't want to lose and they were desperate to win, their will to win is what they're about. Now, playing a team like uh, Notre Dame, who unbelievable shooting team, passing team, cutting team, efficient offensively, um, it was good for us. And we had to play near perfect down the stretch to try to win the game. And the guys did. Over here. Right here. For, for Willie and for uh, Aaron, what's the most upset you've ever seen Coach Cal? <laughs> Willie? Um, probably in practice. Uh, when you're doing an action or a drill and he's explaining it to you probably two or three times and you're still getting it wrong, uh, I think it gets to him a little bit and it gets a little crazy. Aaron? Um, 
Be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be careful. Uh, just practice when, uh, when, we, when we just don't come out to practice with a lot of energy and we come out kind of cool and things like that. So, right over here. Mike Metcalf, ESPN for, for Willie and Andrew. Obviously, a lot of pressure and scrutiny on this team. I've been able to maintain your focus and avoid the off court distractions and drama that sometimes affects teams in this position. Andrew? Um, I mean, I think the pressure is more what other people ha have put on us. So I don't think that's like too real. We just have to stay, stay, what, stay doing what we've been doing and stay together, stick together, stick to the script. Willie? Um, you know, our coaching staff does a, a really good job of, you know, making sure that we're always together and making sure that um, you know, the, you know, every day that, you know, we have dinner with each other or um, everybody's in the locker room with each other for, you know, an hour or so after practice is over and we're just sitting there chilling and um, they just make a, make sure, you know, everybody's, you know, staying together and everybody's in it uh, for each other and, and not in yourself. Back here. Josh Katzen, seen Detroit News for uh, Aaron and Andrew. What were your first impressions of uh, Carl, and how has he impacted the game from your perspective? Aaron? Well, um, last game, he completely took the game over, really. Um, we just kept feeding him and feeding him. Uh, he's pretty unstoppable on the uh, offensive end. He's just a really great player. Andrew? Um, well, my first impression <laughs> of him, I mean, he was a little bit, I mean, he was a freshman, you know what I mean? He was just, just like everyone else when they're young, but. Like Aaron said, he, he's gotten better and better. And when he, when he wants to be, when he wants to be, he's pretty hard to stop. Right here in front. Uh, AJ Rose with the reflector. Trey, can you just talk a little bit about what it means to you to be back here in Indianapolis playing in the Final Four in front of you know, your hometown, family, and friends? What would it mean to bring it home the ninth championship here in front of the Trey? Uh, it's just an exciting moment for me and my family, but you know, I'm just trying to approach it like any other game. And uh, you know, we got to stay focused. And, you know, it's got to go out there and play hard. Right here. For uh, Aaron and then John, but first Aaron, I, I'd like to know, we have all talked about this perfect season, something you guys don't like talking about. You're trying to win a championship right now, but what does it also mean to be trying to do something that no college team has done in 40 years, long before you were born? Aaron? Um, it's just a blessing to be on such a great team. I mean, I could tell my kids and grandkids about being on a team that that is so far 30 and know it um, just 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 <laughs> just so so blessed John we're not perfect we're undefeated um, we've had teams that had their chances to beat us and we tried to we figured it out somehow and and the good news is we talked about it as a team if Willie played bad we still won if Aaron went three for 20 which he's done we still won if Aaron Andrew didn't have his spirit, if Trey against Notre Dame, we still won. Carl <laughs> against, point. who one did point. he have one point against or West none? Virginia. West Virginia. And we win by 40. I told him, we don't need you at all. But they understand that their job is to be prepared to be the best version, but they don't, they got each other's back. We got enough guys. Um, we are not a perfect team. We're undefeated, but we're not perfect. Last question right here. Jeff Greer from the Career Journal. John, how would you define Devin's role on this team and the impact that he's had this year for you? Um, what, when we recruited Devin, I knew he could score the ball. I didn't think he could guard a little bit, and I knew that would be a problem for me to play him. I saw him in Moss Point playing 40-year-old guys who would score on him and run by him, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, you look at him, not only does he score the ball for us, he guards and he rebounds. Um, his shooting takes us to another level, but he does, he's had games where he's 0 for 9 and we still won. So he has been a good teammate. He's been, he and Tyler in practice, and these two can tell you, are ultra, ultra competitive, would you say? They argue every call. like. If we make a call, wait a minute, that's our ball. And then until I have, I mean, that's what they've added to this team. It's not just as players, their competitive spirit. 
they, they, these kids, they all feed off of one another. And then these guys get mad and try to beat them by 100, and then they talk. And that's what's been happening all year for us. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, players. Good luck tomorrow.